So, uh, good morning, everybody. I see you got a few of you here, and I uh, assume you're interested in Git or Jenkins or something along those lines. So, hopefully, you're going to enjoy this. We're going to be kind of talking about the whole flow of development, uh, making changes, and getting them all the way through your test environments, all your intermediate environments, and then production uh, in a smooth way that makes sense. And you know, this is kind of a, a monthly webinar we do, and we keep changing up the platform. I think, you know, Grant, we've done what, Subversion and Git and TFS. Have, we, have I done any others? I thought there was one more, but yeah, I remember those three. Done those three. But yeah, and, it's, it's been a little different every time. Yeah, and, you know, and when we do Jenkins and this today, and we've done TFS build, and we've done uh, Team City, and uh, I don't know if we did Bamboo or not, but you know, the idea is that really this whole process is not technology dependent. You can do however you want. So we'll uh, we, we'll keep doing them, and we'll keep changing up uh, different combinations of, of products, so you can see how it all works, and, and hopefully uh, give it a try. So I am Steve Jones, and I run SQL Server Central as my primary job, and I've been doing that for uh, 15 years now. <laughs> it's just crazy. And I, But I've been working with SQL Server since 1991, so 25 years of SQL Server. I've been working with all the different versions, big companies, small companies, consulting, full-time employee, developer, admin, you know, kind of all across the board with the product. All my contact information is up here. Please feel free if you want to get a hold of me and, uh, you know, ask questions or comments or something else. And then we have Grant online. Grant's going to help host today. Grant, you want to tell them about yourself? Sure. Uh, my name is Grant Fritchie. I work for Redgate Software. I've been, I've been there for now um, coming up on six years. I'm pretty excited about that. Um, I've been working with SQL Server since... Wow, a very, very long time ago, um, and uh, you know, just in all aspects of it, I started out in development and moved into DBA, and now I'm more or less, I guess I, I would say I was back in development again, because I'm not get really a DBA as much anymore. But regardless, I'm pretty excited about it, um, and that is my contact information. If you've got questions on this topic or any other after today, um, please get in touch. I, I will respond to my emails, I promise. Excellent. So our agenda is, is from really quick. I want to go through some of these things pretty quickly and then really get to get to the demo and let you guys ask questions, comments, that kind of thing. We are recording this whole thing, uh, including all of our nonsense at the beginning, <laughs> which I assume will, somebody will cut out of there. But, uh, you know, if you need to go back and look at it or you have to leave early, they'll be there. There are uh, a, There is a question item in the little control panel from GoToWebinar, so please feel free to ask questions in there. Either Grant will... Uh, take care of them, you know, during, during the demo or I'll, you know, answer them online or, you know, we'll get them posted either way. So uh, let's go forward. So who is Redgate? Uh, you know, we, we have lots of customers, a lot of high customers. Grant, do you want to run that first poll while we're, while I'll just chat for a minute? Sure. So, so we'd like to know, you know, how many of you use our products really, you know, I assume most of you do, or some of you do. Now Redgate, you know, we, the philosophy really for us is that we work with SQL Server and .NET, and we try to make it easier for you to build software, right? So we have these ingeniously simple tools that are designed to help you be more efficient in building software. Uh, in addition, Redgate supports the community. They support, they run Simple Talk, and then they purchase SQL Server Central. So, you know, we are uh, part of the community, and, and Redgate's happy to invest in the community because not only do we want you to buy our tools, but we want just the community overall to be better. You know, we, we really believe in that. So somebody says, great, Alberta, thank you very much. We appreciate the compliments. We, we do try, and we love getting feedback from you. And so if you see us at a SQL Saturday at the past summit next week, anywhere else, please give us feedback. Let us know what you love, what you don't love, what we can do better, what you want to see. Uh, we, we like that kind of stuff. Right. And so of the people who voted, here's the results. Um, so it's, it's you know pretty good distribution across the tools. Nice, nice. That's good to hear. I'm glad I'm seeing more and more people use multiple tools, which I think is great. All right. So let's move on. So w one of the ideas that I think uh, throughout my career, you know, and, and maybe Grant sees it as well, is that, you know, we realize that building software, it's, it's hard, it's not hard, but it's certainly complex and it's been problematic over the years, you know, and, and I think over time we've gotten better and better about trying to build and deploy software in a way that just is smoother for our clients so that we can deploy when we need to, uh, things work correctly, we respond to clients quickly, 
you know, and whether you're using Agile or Scrum or, you know, whatever methodology you're trying to use to build software, you want some sort of application lifecycle process, right? It doesn't need to be big and heavyweight, but you want something there. But databases are hard. And in all the work that I've done in DevOps and continuous integration, continuous delivery over the years, the database has always been the problem because of state, because I can't get rid of data. <laughs> and ultimately, you know, I've kind of come to the conclusion, it's really just tables. I mean, you know, views, store procedures, functions, assemblies, modules, all that stuff. None of that is a problem with uh, migrating versions, really. But it's mostly the database because I have to keep those tables and keep a state steady between changes. So it's problematic. Okay? When we don't do that or when we're trying to deal with all the issues, we have all these problems that you see up there, you know, that the database is either... Uh, has to move first or it's too slow to move and it's, and it's impacting our ability to make changes to the application. Actually, I'm going through this SQL Server Central now as uh, we're trying to upgrade our database, or sorry, our forum software. Uh, there's some challenges in the database of trying to make sure that all this data moves correctly, you know, and trying to track back the changes over the years or, you know, as we've done test migrations, trying to go backwards is almost impossible because as we move that data and we transform it, uh, the reverse transformations are not simple. And so uh, the result is most of us, or at least most people I've known in the past, have been nervous and scared about doing releases, doing deployments to their environments. And so uh, we don't do it, and it's always a big deal. It's stressful. It's problematic. And more importantly, the more that we do it in a manual process because uh, we don't have a smooth system, then we make mistakes. And so we burn a lot of time and effort doing this kind of stuff. If you go to what we call... DLM, a database lifecycle management philosophy, what we really want to do is we want to give you repeatability and reliability so that you know what it takes to do a release, what kinds of things might cause problems, uh, you're more efficient, it comes down to really a push button type of deployment. And more importantly, you can go faster, not in terms of releases, I don't expect you to release every day or every week, but that you can release when you want to release. So if, if somebody comes to you and says, we have a bug, we need to release on Friday, we can run development through a process, we can test our systems, we can get it deployed to intermediate environments like QA or test or user acceptance or beta or something else, and then get it to production when we want to. And it really comes about by uh, putting a process in place that isn't, the technology side isn't too heavyweight, it's more a people process change that we have to do. And that is complex and it takes time, but uh, we can do it. Now, the state of DevOps reports, uh, I've been doing these webinars, I think, for two years now, and, and I've read, I think, four of these reports over the years, and they all come to similar things, that, you know, if you build a DevOps process, which really means that developers and QA and operations and architects and clients all kind of work together and all have visibility in the process, you're more agile, you're more flexible, you can deploy code when you want to, you can deploy code faster, which really comes down to, from the time a client requests something till the time they see it in an application, you shrink that time so that you get better feedback, quicker feedback, and then developers can work on the things that are truly efficient. And you tend to be able to run your organization at a more profitable level just because you're not wasting time and you can respond to whatever you need to respond to in your organization. All right, so how does Redgate help? Really what we try to do is, is plug into your development process and help you build software. So at the top, as we go from left to right across the top, this is you as a developer, you as a DBA, you as the operation person, you as the manager, uh, you're a part of this process. So developers are on the left, they uh, write code, obviously against their own databases or shared database, however you want to work. We, we store that in a version control system so that just so that we have keep track of it. We know what changes are made by which people in which order and we just are aware of all these changes. Uh, and then we use automation. So we use continuous integration. We use release management to uh, get these changes moving all the way to production. And I think, yeah, I have this. So Redgate plugs into this process in multiple places. So in the developer, obviously, in your desktop, we have prompt, we have test, we have source control, uh, we have data generator. We have other products here that plug into Visual Studio or Management Studio, try to make your development process easier. Uh, we plug in two version control systems. So SQL source control is a horrible name because it is not a source control system. Uh, it really is a plugin that makes it easier for you to use TFS or Git or Subversion or Vault or Perforce or Mercurial or CVS or uh, source safe or anything you want to do. We'll plug into any source control system and store your code there. And we do it 
in that we store the create statements so that we always kind of have a full view of what the code looks like at this point in time. We could store the alter statements, which, you know, it's philosophically, it's just a different way of doing things. But one of the problems I've had when I do the alter statements is that if I look at a table and I see an alter, I have to go back through versions to figure out what all the other versions of the table were, or, um, you know, I have to look through a bunch of comments. And it's just slightly more cumbersome. Uh, so we made the philosophical decision to just store all the create statements in your version control system, so that's how you see it. Let's um, check on that. How many people are using version control? And oh, yeah, yeah, using? please. Yeah, let's run a poll and see. So let us know what version control systems you use. Uh, they, they all work well. I like Git, and that's really because I'm offline a lot. I'm traveling, I'm on planes, I'm in different places, and so Git means that the the repo I have here on my desktop, the repo on my laptop, actually I have two laptops, I can keep them all in sync easier with Git. Uh, I can still make commits and get things done offline. Uh, Mercurial works the same way. When I have TFS or SVN or uh, Subversion, I have to be online to connect to a server, so that's you know kind of a pain. I know about Grant, do you have a preference? Do you care? I, I kind of don't care. I actually like Git a lot. I've, I've gotten more and more used to it uh, you know, in the last year or so, um, and, and uh, I, I appreciate what it does. Um, I, I like its foundation on the concept of branching as just a fundamental aspect of, of source control. Yeah. Um, I think that works better in a lot of ways. Yeah. Uh, let me close this out. Close it out and see. i got to tell you, I really love yeah. TFS with Git as the interface, though. You know, I use that a lot. Yeah. All right, so oh, my screen is... So only 8% are saying they didn't use it at all, so, so we're good. doing good. Good job, guys, please. Right. Every, pass the word. Everybody needs to use version control. <laughs> all right. Uh, once we're in version control, we use continuous integration. And continuous integration really is just, it's kind of a backstop or a check for us as the developers that it automatically runs the test. It automatically makes sure the software compiles because as much as I'm sure all of you are talented developers, you cannot imagine how many times that I myself or other people I've worked with have compiled something, had it working great, and then you make one more change and then you commit it, right? You think I'm going to add a comment, I'm going to do something small, I'm going to reformat, and you break code. So with continuous integration, the idea is that we very quickly build your changes with everybody else's changes and we tell you right away if there's a problem, if you've broken something. And at Redgate, we use uh, a SQL release product or DLM automation product, I guess, that just plugs into any of your build servers, TFS, TeamCity, Jenkins, Bamboo, Cruise Control, Go, Hudson. Uh, uh, there's probably others out there. We, we'll really plug in anything because we can run off of the command line with PowerShell. So we can plug in anywhere. And then uh, one of the keys of continuous integration is having testing. So please, please, please learn how to test your software. Um, I'm not, I don't want to belabor that point, though. And then what do we do? We want to release this stuff. And so I've released software in many different ways over the years. As I've been working more with release management in TFS, release management, or Octopus Deploy, I find it really makes my life simpler because uh, it is slightly cumbersome to set up because I have to stop and think about all the steps that I perform. But once it's running, man, it makes it so easy for me to release software. And I'll actually show you today, we'll release software uh, from development to testing to staging to production very quickly. And then I don't want to forget that once you release your software, you have to instrument it metric. You have to monitor it. Uh, Redgate, we have SQL Monitor and DLM Dashboard and SQL Backup. But y however you do it, you have to monitor and determine whether things are working or not working, whether they're being used, uh, how they're performing, and then feed that information back to developers so that they can kind of go left to right through this process as quickly as possible. Or, at whatever speed that is for you. If that's making changes every week, if it's making changes every day or once a year, we want you to be able to move at your speed with confidence. All right, uh, don't worry about that. So let's do, let's demo this stuff. So let me find my VM. All right, looks like that's up. Let me find my mouse. <laughs> and let me zoom in slightly. So. I've got this set of databases up here that I'm going to work with today. Uh, the names don't really matter other than they just represent different environments. So uh, I've got two development databases, so Grant and Steve here, even though I think I'm only making changes today. We have an integration environment where we actually would pull all those changes together, and typically these would be separate instances. So Grant would have his database on his laptop where he could work. I would have mine on mine, so I would be separate. 
And then from version control, we would kind of get all of that code together and merge it into that integration database. And, and I'll show you how we do that in the automated process. And then from integration, we want to be able to release to testing anytime. So QA can just pull a version of code to testing any point. Then we release to acceptance and production as needed. We could release to uh, UAT as well, which I don't think I've set up here. But um, the flow will kind of be uh, dev Steve to integration to testing to acceptance to production um, in that flow. The fact that these are all in one instance doesn't matter. It's just because it makes my life simple to demo this thing rather than trying to remember which VM I'm working on. So uh, in Dev Steve, I've got you know tables, I've got views, I got all kinds of stuff here. So let me make a change. So you know I'm more of a, a command line guy. So let me alter a table. What tables do I have here? Uh, I don't want to break something too badly here. Well, I'll just pick blogs, and I'll say I'm going to add uh, Tuesday, which is an int, All right? Because I'm bored, and that's a good change. I don't know why we're making that change, but it's good. Um, and we'll get Tuesday. Oh, no, that was blogs, right? Uh, blogs, and what I don't want to do is I just want to get a couple of columns. Where's my Tuesday column? I need to refresh. There it is. <laughs> And I have too much stuff there. There we go. Obviously, if I had left this like this, where this doesn't work, right, I have syntax error, uh, I know people that would have gone, they would have compiled this procedure, and they would have said it works great. And then we said, hey, I want one more column. And they would have put this in there and then saved it in version control. We don't want to do that. Right? We want to make sure that all of our code works. So once I'm sure that all my code works, and I'm testing it. One of the things that we do is you'll notice that I have this kind of green shade on here and a little blue ball. This green shade, which you also see down at the bottom here, means that I've linked this database to version control with SQL source control from Redgate. And all that means is that I have the ability to take my changes from this database and put them into my Git repository. These little blue blobs just let me know that I've actually made changes. And if I expand these, what we'll see is that come up here, that blogs table that I altered is the one that has the blob on it. So I know what changes are made. And then down here, uh, the new, oops, I think I need to refresh this, right? It knows there's a change. That new proc I make is right here. Obviously, it's built on SSMS, so I have to, you know, work within the constraints of what's there, which means I do need to refresh things automatically. But SQL Source Control has actually got a process running in the back that's checking to see what's changed. In this case, here's my plugin. If I go to the Setup tab, so you can see, this is actually going to this path, which is a Git folder, Git repository here. I've linked this in there. You know, I, I can do get latest, I can pull, I can do all the stuff that I might do. But in this case, uh, I've got two changes. And so let's make this a little larger. I've got that change to a table, and then I've got the store procedure change. And the table change, the standard source control thing on the left, I see what is in the database here. And then on the right, what's in source control. And of course, that column doesn't exist. And then same thing for the store procedure. So let me commit this, new changes. And he's going to commit. For those of you that have worked with Git, uh, I commit things, but they're not everywhere because I have to push them out. And so without leaving Management Studio, I can just push these things out. One note, and I left this up here, uh, I'm pushing all commits because this is doing a Git push. So if I've committed from Visual Studio or you know PyCharm or Eclipse or any, some other IDE, uh, into this Git repository, it's pushing everything. It's not pushing database changes because it's just pushing anything that's staged. So just be aware of that. So let's push those things out there and they'll make those changes. That folder, let me grab this, is just a folder on my Explorer. And if I were to look in here, I just see the normal stuff that I would see. And if I look at this code, I have a create table statement, I'll zoom in slightly, and that column has been added to it. 
Okay. That's this is just scripting out as you would normally script out from SQL Compare if you're using that, or uh, the SMO interface, which wouldn't necessarily get all of this stuff, but uh, you know it's just a normal scripting out of this code. Same thing for store procedures, you know, for functions, for other stuff. These are just dot SQL files. There's nothing magic about any of these files. All right. So I put changes in there. Ideally, I should have pulled from my repository just to see if there's anything there. There's nothing there, so I haven't broken the world. So now I've taken code that I've written. I've put it into version control. What's the next step? We want to go to continuous integration. And in this case, I actually have a Jenkins build. This is Jenkins that's set up for my project that's actually running right now. If I look over here, we can see that uh, we're running a new build right here. And uh, this build is, you know, it's got all of the stuff that's going on in here for my particular project. So if I were to uh, go in here and look at how this is done, you'll see I've got uh, my history down the left. So I've got all my builds in Jenkins. This is a free product. Jenkins is a free open source product, by the way. So uh, the interface is not so polished, <laughs> but it does work. Um, I've got my source code system here, so uh, I'm using Git, right? Here's my repository. This is the actually the remote that I pushed to here. So I configure that in, in here. And then what I have is a few items that uh, are specific to Redgate. We've got these plugins. So in this case, the first thing I'm doing is I'm doing a build. And a build is a really low bar, but what it is taking is all of the database code uh, from my VCS root actually in these subfolders, and it's going to recompile it onto a SQL server. In this case, it's compiling it into local DB. You know, I could use a, a normal SQL server here, a development server, but in this case, I'm just using local DB on this Jenkins instance. And that, uh, you know, it's just a little bit lighter weight and it's smoothly, okay? Uh, I build a package which allows me to save the state of version control because as I move on to other environments, I don't want to go back to version control because version control will have changed. So I kind of have a snapshot of what things look like right here. Uh, you know, I can add additional parameters. I can do all kinds of things to configure this, but this is this low bar that lets me know, cannot all my database code be assembled correctly? The next thing I'm going to do is actually do a test. And in here, uh, again, I'm picking up that package so that I know that this package actually works. This was what I pulled from version control and this package works. Again, I'm going to uh, validate this on local DB. And what I'm actually doing is I'm running tests here. I'm running these unit tests. And I'll show you these tests in a second. I could add test data. I could do other stuff that I want to do in here. But for now, what I'm really doing is running these tests. These tests, let's come back over here. Um, and I've got, I think it was unit tests are just it's a call here. I've got one test in this database right now that's being run from the T-SQL-T framework. If you noticed when I showed you these objects, I had all these T-SQL-T objects here. And when I come down to, whoops, down here, I have all these items in my procedures as well. T-SQL-T is a testing framework just like XUnit or JUnit excuse me, your end unit, and it really is just a framework that allows you to test code. And so my test is right now a store procedure. And all this is doing is, if I come in here, is it's, it's putting some data in a table. It's calling a store procedure, and then it's trying to discern did the results that from the store procedure match this value. That's all we're trying to do. It's a very simple test. Uh, it's a little bit too simple you know, to, to showcase things, but hopefully you understand it. Uh, the idea is that I can just write all these tests, and I can write other tests. So if I want to write more tests, I can write them and run them here. And I'll show you some a little more of that in a minute. After I run that test, so I run this build. It's highlighted slightly with Jenkins. Then I run my tests here. If those pass, the next thing I do is I publish a package out to my Octopus Deploy server. And this is publishing a change out to a server that will actually release to an integration system. In this case, I'm calling the Octo Xe. I'm going to create a release, and then I'm going to do a deployment to this environment. And this is just 
a command line call to the Octopus Deploy server. Now I could I could run this. I've run this in TFS. I've run this in uh, Bamboo. I've run this in Team City. I could run it any number of ways, but I'm running it here. Hey Grant, why don't we run the CI I was polls? just going to interrupt you for that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so we've got a poll up on uh, if you guys use CI or not. Um, back in the day, we rolled our own CI server. That was a bear. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we never really rolled a CI yeah. server, but we did roll a package process that, uh, you know, we used to release to both test and staging and production. And so I wish we yeah, had I mean, server, you know. I wish we'd had one too. <laughs> But we, you know, we get to the point where we could do our, we could do testing locally before it ever went out to QA or any place else. So, so we, you know, we, we started doing DevOps very early on um, at my last job. So we're strong believers in it. Yeah, and yeah. It's, um, it, it's such a huge, it's such a huge win to be able to automate the builds, automate the tests. Yeah, I, I mean, if, you, if you're an app developer, right, and you're not doing CI, it's crazy. I mean, absolutely, yeah. in Visual Studio or Eclipse or whatever, you should be, even if you don't want to implement a CI server, you should have some process that can pull everything from source control and run MS Build from the command line and make sure that everything works correctly. Interestingly enough, everyone who voted actually already has a CI process running. That's a first for me. I'm used to seeing half the room not having CI. This is great. Yeah. So uh, I assume most of you are doing it for s applications and maybe for databases, but so I won't really belabor the point, but the whole idea, right, we want the CI running, and we, we're treating this database just like our, uh, our application code. I'm going to leave this page because I don't really care. And so as I run, let me come back over here, I can see all my builds. And so you can see as I've run different builds the last few days practicing, uh, there was a point where in July I blew up some builds. You know, I've been slowly going through this process, uh, and this is all database builds. All these items on the left are the database builds. So I did that release. Let me come over here. That release actually was this 0.28 release to integration, uh, and this was performed just a few minutes ago. And so if I were to actually look at this, this actually occurred. Um, started seven minutes ago, ran for 28 seconds. Here's the process that it went through and it deployed successfully, right? Everything's green. I'm going to go ahead and promote this to testing while I'm here just because I can. And so when I look through here, you can see I'm now releasing. And you can see in the past I've released these other versions out. 27 I did this morning um, did not get released beyond testing. It only released there. But I don't have to release this all the way. I can skip 27 and just push 28 in. Now, I did, I added a store procedure here. We added this get uh, Tuesday procedure here and we changed this blog. That appeared in my integration database. So if I were to look at this blogs table here, here's the column I added. And if I go down to my store procedures and refresh this, uh, here's that get Tuesday. Right. Now, in the testing area, I don't know if I'll catch it in time. Let's try to go here. It's already been pushed out because the release worked. Whoops, release here, completed. Uh, I'm going to kick this off to acceptance just real quick to show you something. But let me come back and look at my acceptance environment before this deploys. And I know this won't deploy. So let's expand these out. So there's, there is no Tuesday item there. And there is no get Tuesday there, right? So there's not there's don't exist yet. In the deployment process, all I'm doing is taking the steps that I would do manually and I'm programming them in. So in this case, if we look at this, I actually have a stop in here and I'm gonna let this run while we're doing it. But I want to look at the process briefly and show you what's happening. Here's my process for release, and this is the same process I'm going to use all the time. Right? Now, in this case, I had to pick five steps, but I have all these things that are applied in different ways. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to pick up my NuGet package from the Octopus server. This was the NuGet package that was shot out from Jenkins. So Jenkins, uh, stay on this page. When we went down here to this, uh, this uh, publish, 
here's my NuGet feed. This is for the Octopus server itself. And then what I did was I picked up a package. I used the build number from here. And I there's the server. And then it pushes out this package. And if I go over um, here, let's zoom in. <laughs> you got to remember to click. This is that package that was produced in the build artifact that is I'm using. So in, in the .NET world, and I was doing this in Visual Studio, this would have been my uh, XE and DLL and resource files and everything that I had packaged up to release for my application. In the Java world, it would have been you know my jar files and my configuration items in there. But, I, but they all get pushed out to this server. And then you'll notice what I do in my build is uh, I run a refresh from production only in acceptance. So in that environment I just was I just started the release to before we looked at this, uh, I'm actually going to refresh from production so that I'm sure that my release is going to work correctly. So even though at this point I've released integration and testing, I, I want a real check against production in case production has changed or there's some issue. So this is my final check and I only do it in this one environment. I create a release and this gives me an artifact that tells me what's the upgrade script, what's going to happen, and I can review this. <clears throat> Excuse me. In acceptance only, I had that manual review. And I, and I didn't spend time on it right there, but uh, it did ask me to approve the process. And I can set this up to notify somebody, uh, have them review scripts, make a stamp that says I approve this change. I could have multiple people approve this. Uh, you know, it's, it's really configurable to however you want it to work. And then finally, I just run my release process, which really is going to execute my script. And this is something I do. And it doesn't matter whether I'm doing it in TFS or Bamboo or here in Octopus Deploy, I make a similar process. And each one of these steps, I configure it to work exactly as I want it to work. If I needed to step in here to say, uh, disable replication for production and then enable replication at the bottom, I would add those steps and I would say, run these in production. So I, ha I have the ability to kind of configure this however I want to. That process completed successfully. Again, if I were to look at this, you know, I could go through and get the logs of, of everything that happened. For example, if I go through here, each one of these items is, you know, expandable or collapsible. So I can see at the various steps what happened at each area. You know, so my refresh from production is a backup database and restore database. <laughs> nothing, nothing magic happening there, but you know, it's just, I'm automating the manual processes that I want to go through. In this case, I also have uh, the artifacts. So I, I've done this multiple times, so I see multiple artifacts. So let me come over. I want that one release to acceptance. Uh, you'll notice over here on this side, I have some artifacts. These are produced by the Redgate products. So my up, update that SQL script, you'll notice I've got some setup code. So if you're familiar with SQL compare, you'll see this. Um, in this case, let me zoom in slightly. This change was that dot 27 release. I dropped the test procedure that was there. Here's the alter to add my code. Uh, here's the creation. It's right below here where I'm going to do a create procedure and create that code. And then in wrapping all of this in the ways that SQL Compare does, because I touch blogs, it's going to refresh my view. Uh, it's going to close out the transaction, either roll it back or commit it, but set it forward. So as a DBA or as a sysadmin, I have the ability to review this. Uh, if I want to send this to project managers or somebody for reporting, uh, we also produce this lovely report on the uh, in, in HTML. So you can see I, I've added a few procedures. So there's a procedure that I've added. I've removed a proc. I've modified blogs. So I can see what the minus and plus is happening here. Uh, this really is just uh, an easier way to review what's going on. So for people that aren't necessarily sysadmins just want to know what changes are coming. So I might shoot this to developers so that they know what is actually being released or architects. I might shoot it to clients so they know what's changing. They have the ability to see what's happening. But of course, if they want to see the script, we can actually look at the whole script for the people that really care about the details of the code. They can actually see what's happening here. And whether you're doing .NET code or database code, this is really how you want this process to work. You want it to be smooth and simple. And if I'm happy to it, I can, of course, promote it to production. All right.
Uh, should we see who's using release software, release management software, Grant? Absolutely. I'll get my Got copy. Got that queued up. <laughs> so voting's going now. Yeah, release management software is not as well adapted, adopted, adopted, um, <laughs> adopted by most people. Uh, I, I I just don't see that many people using it. Um, those who do use it actually fall in love with it, but but uh, a lot of people aren't aren't up on it just yet. Yeah, I think a lot of people don't know about it, and there's a trust issue. You worry about it, but sure, I'm telling you, you just program this to work the same way that you want to work. And you know, if if I want to add something, I can just add a step. And I've got all kinds of things that I can add. Oops, I'm still in the poll. We'll show you in a minute. Yeah, one second. Okay, looks like polling's closed. Let me share that. And so only a fifth of, uh, of you are not uh, using management uh, right now. Most are using Octopus. I am not shocked at all. Yeah. And Microsoft Bamboo and other. Cool. Yeah, Octopus. I think Octopus is great. I think VSTS TFS 2015 is fantastic as well. Uh, they both work similar ways, but you know, here's my script. If I wanted to do something different, I can just add something in here. For example, maybe I'm nervous about the database and I don't want to do the actual deployment here or I've got other things to do. I can just send an email to somebody that says, hey, go run this script. Go run this artifact here manually and don't have the system run it. Or you know, maybe I only want to deploy stored procedure code. I can you know, configure SQL compare to only do store procedures or only do views and ignore tables. And in this process, I would have a step that would say, you know, notify the DBA to manually make table changes so that if there's an issue, they're ready. And then when they say they're done, automatically deploy my store procedure code. I can configure this however I want it to work. The key is that I just try to duplicate what I would do in a manual way. I program, program it so that I'm confident it's done the same way every time, as I'm sure all of you at some point have made a change that uh, you, you know you didn't do it correctly. You forgot a step, you added a step, something broke. What we're trying to do is is smooth out this entire process. And certainly, I could stop here. You know, at this point, I've deployed to production, but I could have stopped in acceptance. I could have just picked up this update SQL and then manually executed this in production because I'm more comfortable with that. And, and, and that's what I would really encourage you to do is to, uh, in this entire process, go slowly, step by step, start in a version control system. So, you know, use SQL source control to uh, save stuff off. Use SQL test here to actually, uh, where's my database here, run my tests. So if I want to run tests, I can run tests as developers and do that. Once I've got it saved off, and once I'm confident that all my code is there, implement a CI system. Everybody here, I think, said they had a CI system. So whether you want to use Jenkins, whether you want to use uh, TFS, anything, just implement a CI system. And really, the technology doesn't matter. Jenkins is free. Cruise Control is free. I think for small projects, Team City and VSTS and Bamboo are free. Uh, you know, pick whatever you want. And then set up your release process. Even if you only release the test environments for QA, do that. Once you're confident with it, you're comfortable with it, then you can start to move on to further environments and make things work. All right, any questions? Anybody want to see anything else? I don't see a lot popping up. People. We have not seen a single question come by yet. So either I did a great job or nobody's paying attention. But that's all right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wait, and of course, here they come. All right. All right. A very specific question. We already used DLM automation. Uh, one license on our build server, which houses TFS. We want to use Octopus for deploys and are confused with Redgate licensing. According to Redgate Sales, David Cook, in order to use Octopus with a DLM automation for deploys, we can install the DLM automation component on a single release management tentacle and license it with no issue. All right, that sounds so, like we need it on each tentacle. Yeah, so I'm not a, I'm not a, I'm not a sales guy, and that Grant isn't either. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but. Uh, my understanding is that any place the DLM automation runs, you need a license. So if it is on a technical running, you need a license there. You know, depending on how you structure your environment, you know, it'll depend on every license you need. And because we're licensing DLM automation as part of the tool belt, you know, if you have five developers and you have five DLM licenses to be on five different instances. So I could have one on a CI build server, on a test server, and on a production server, right? And I could have tentacles on each one of those. 
I don't have to, you know, the way that the tentacles work or the way that we build servers typically work is that um, there is a central server that runs things, but I don't necessarily have to install things there because I can put an agent of some sort on another system. So, um, you know, you could have a system that has SQL on it where your, data, your builds will occur even though your CI server is separate, and so you would only need a license for that agent system or that tentacle system. But uh, I'm not really a licensing guy, so... Um, Take that with a grain of salt. <laughs> that's, that's my understanding. Grant, is, does that sound right to you? Is that it sense? sounds right? I, I'm again. I'm 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 punting on that one just because I I really don't know licensing. It it I, I'm you know yeah. probably gonna learn that at some point. Yeah, I keep learning technical stuff. I don't know why. Uh, so we have another question. How are SSIS packages handled within DLM? Okay, so how do you deploy SSIS packages now? Uh, you probably don't do this. You probably don't use DTUtil. But ultimately, whatever you're doing has a command line underneath it. Either it's it's a PowerShell command line or it's you're going to use DTUtil or something else to deploy your packages. Right? If you're only comfortable doing it with an SSDT and, and picking publish, then uh, what you really want to do is figure out how you deploy those packages now. Okay, And so in this case, you, DTUtil will work. And so in the build, what I can do is I could add another step in here. And um, what I could do is add a Windows batch command, right? Now, now I wouldn't do it necessarily with my database. I might have something else. But I might have a dtutil call here that is slash source. I do a slash v to verify. I can do whatever I want to do here. And maybe I have uh, testing steps that I add around this that would run the package and verify row counts or whatever I want to do, okay? Uh, I'm not going to do this because I'm going to blow something up. So uh, in the in the CI system, I would just do whatever I want to do to do that deployment. And then the same thing in my process here, whoops, my process here is that I would add a step that said, uh, you know, I am going to do a deployment. I don't know that they have a... I don't know if they have an SSIS component here. They have a script, and now we do the same thing here, is that I would um, program the deployment for SSIS like I would do anything else, and, and I would just pick a step and put that in place. And so whatever you're doing manually, you have to figure out how I would do this manually if I did not have the tool interface, and then program that into your system. Hopefully that makes sense to you. Uh, what else do we have? All right, we've got, uh, let's see, um, we talked about process, let's see, Nikki says, we talk a lot about process and automation, and Octopus is a big part of that. Which parts of this process were managed by DLM, and how does it integrate with some homegrown deploy processes? Uh, so what's managed by DLM? So uh, in this case, so in, let me go back to Jenkins real quick, and we'll look at that. So in the, in the CI process, what is managed is, pulling all code from version control, executing it in a database, and then building the upgrade script uh, as part of the release process. And the release process, in this case, it bleeds in Octopus Deploy. So when I do this create release in the Octo server call, what that is actually going to do is execute this process. And so in my integration environment, I'm going to get the NuGet package, which uh, will have been sent in from Jenkins. I will create the release. This is DLM. And then I will deploy the release. If you have a homegrown deploy process, it just, it, I mean, it's, it's such an open-ended thing. It's hard to say what I'm doing here. Because if I could certainly stop at any point in time. And let me just, let me just release something else real quick while I got a second. Um, oh, let me change this proc because I knew that. Uh, so I can show you that, and let's say I don't want the count of, I don't want this, I want author ID. All right, so we'll commit this. And I need to be in the right database, because I committed it somewhere else. Here, changes, please don't use comments like this, it's a horrible idea. We'll push it and we'll have it go. So you could implement this process, right? So I'm making changes, I'm using the plugin, it is grabbing my changes and is committing them over here, and then my Jenkins build will run. So let's leave. I don't know why it thinks I've changed something every time. Uh, so we'll see a build come out in here. Once this build occurs, 
we'll actually see a package appear in here as well. So uh, it's pending in four seconds, it kicks off, there's my build, it's gonna run. So at, at any point in time, right, like I could stop, let me zoom in so I can draw. I could just do this part and stop, and then from this point forward, I could manually execute everything as part of my deployment process. Uh, I could, you know, go this far, and then say, you know, I've got, I've got a, an XE. Let's see if I can do this without embarrassing myself too badly. And I've got a DB. And these things I'm going to execute manually or I'm going to send into some homegrown process. You know, uh, I can integrate it however I want. I just need to understand what I'm doing at each step of my process. And in terms of my manual process or your homegrown deploy process now, you'd have to just decide what do I need as inputs to that process uh, or what do I want to automate or not automate there and then how do I want to change that over time and that's really where you stand and my build's still running it's a little slow today while that's running yeah while that's running what else the next, the next question is um, are we able to use DLM automation with SQL Azure uh, we have tried to use Visual Studio Online to do release management side and have had con connectivity issues. However, it seems to be, however, doing it as part of the build worked fine. Yeah, so um, you can. You can. I've done it. But, um, you know, connectivity is funny in Azure because uh, not only do you have just the can I get there or not, <laughs> is, is, my, is, is my VM or is my SQL Azure database alive? And, and it is flaky at times where it, uh, you know, it goes up and down. Um, see if this refreshes. I mean, we need to refresh. Yeah, I've, I've seen connectivity issues occasionally, um, but most of the time it just works. I mean, it, it luckily enough, I mean, it, it's largely just you're connecting up to a database, you're making the same kind of... Yeah, um, so the weirdness, though, as I before, think great so. organizations is that uh, the firewalling is weird. So you might add your firewall, your IP in for your build server or yourself, but when you, if I, if, if these were separate VMs, so if I was on uh, one server for Jenkins and one server for Active Display, I need to make both of those, uh, the, both those IPs or both that uh, items added to my firewall rules in Azure. So there can be, you know, some some weirdness there. Uh, so let me go back real quick. So here's here's the package. I changed that one store procedure. I could stop right here and I could email this file to a DBA and say, here is how we pop this into a homegrown deployment script. For that matter. If I've got another scripting engine I built that's going to deploy, uh, you know, maybe multiple things, maybe it's going to go to five databases, maybe it's going to go to uh, grab a .NET thing and stuff, I can certainly uh, cut and paste this script or take it and run it as part of SQL command or PowerShell or anything else. So I can integrate however I want. Uh, what else? Octopus instead so of Microsoft. Another question. Yeah. Uh, no, no advantage. I mean, I mean, they, they they're just two different pieces of software, right? I mean, Octopus is, you know, made by a small team of guys in Australia, and they, um, they're they agile, and they move, and they, they, they do some neat things in how they build the plugins. You know, if uh, you want to use TFS and Microsoft release, uh, you know, use that. I mean, you know, there's, there's different things there. You know, there's cost to consider. There's, uh, you know, resources. You know, Microsoft uh, is not likely to listen to you if you want a particular change, whereas the Octopus guys might you know, no advantage, right? Uh, Grant, any, you care? No, I'd, I'd say the same thing. I, I wouldn't care. Uh, I'd want to use one or the other. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, one of the two would be my preference, but I would definitely want to implement one. But as as opposed to, you know, as opposed to which, nah, flip a coin. Um, they, yeah. they both get the job done. Same for me. Like, I, I, I wouldn't look, I mean, nothing against Bamboo or some of the others. I just, I think VSTS is fantastic. And I think um, yeah. Octopus Deploy is fantastic. So I just wouldn't look beyond them because I don't think anything else is, you know, it's going to be better. You know, my rule of thumb, which Andy Warren taught to me years ago, is if it's not 20% better, I'm not changing. Right? Right. I, don't, I don't use Bing because it's not 20% better than Google. So until it's 20% better, I'm just sticking with one of these. <laughs> so right. the next one, uh, what's the best way to manage large data set changes? Now, that's an interesting question. All right, so large changes. So let's assume, let's assume for the sake of argument that uh, I'll do two things here. So, so I've got this um, RSS feeds table, right? There's not much in here. 
uh, I'm going to make a change. I'm going to make two changes to this. All right, so one is I'm going to insert data. Oh, let's update data, actually. I'll update RSS set feed equal to summit where feed ID is equal to four. I don't know why I pick on four. So I'm going to make a change there. So that's a data change because I see that's a question. So Ron, let's assume that instead of this having four rows, let's assume this table has four billion rows. So if I were to do uh, this, uh, let's actually do alter column. So if I were to alter column, um, let's say feed burn, and I were to make this a varchar 200, right? This could potentially be really bad. <laughs> <laughs> if I go to production, this could be problematic, right? And maybe really what I have to do is, you know, maybe I need to create table pound temp. Oh, shoot. I'm just going to say this. Assume that that's a hash mark. I don't remember where the hash is on the UK keyboard. I think it's is it here. No. Here. Ah, the hell with it. I don't know where it is, but it's, just pretend this is a hash. Um, feeds, right, I'd say temp feeds with stuff in it, and then I'm insert temp feeds select star from RSS, right? I might have to do this kind of data manipulation change and then put this one last. And that could be extremely impactful to production because it's very time consuming and it's an issue. The only way that I've seen that this is handled well is that I'm going to commit my change because it was there. Yeah. Let me commit this data change. Imagine that I had a second line right here that said um, table change, right? And and we can do migration scripts and we could add that stuff in there. As a matter of fact, let me, let me just push this out so that it runs. But, you know, I could have here and say, Actually, let me make that change. Where was I? Um, alter table. Let's assume I did this, but this is a script I really want to run, right? Whoops. Ah, can't type. When I were to come in here and do this commit, I broke everything. Ah, what did I break there? I think I, uh, yeah. I don't think I, I think I, that bit to the thing is an invalid change. Let me undo that change. <laughs> this is development, right? This is real development. This is how it works. I do something and I break it horribly. Uh, let's reverse this, actually. Alter. Table. Not Tom. Table. RSS. Alter. Column. Feed. I want burner. Let's make it a bit. This is how this is how development works for most of us, right? We blow things up and then it works and everything's there. Oh, so I made this change. All right, so here I've got a not null change, right? Changing from null to not null. Let's imagine that that is actually a very problematic change in my in my system, right? That it's going to take an hour or five hours to make this change because I've had those changes. What I could do is as part of this migration script, so I could generate a script. And I could say this is this is a big deal, All right? So I'm gonna say um, large table change to RSS feeds, and I could put other stuff in here. So I could put all the other code that I want in here and commit this. What I would do though is in my build process when I was over here, I would have a test that looked for any alters against that table because I know that that table is going to cause issues in production. And I would fail to build on changes there only because I want visibility into that change. And then what I would do is I would kick off an extended review to say, does this script actually make sense? Is this the best process for making this change? Because there's no magic to making large data changes. Okay, there's, there's only a few ways you can do these in SQL Server, so you have to follow some process. Right? I could 
I could insert all this data, I could make the change to the RSS feed, then I could do a, a metadata switch and rename both tables. You know, I could batch updates, I could add a trigger with multiple columns that are moving data. I, I can do whatever I want, but the way that I do it manually is what I'm going to have to program in here. And I would fail the build because I would want multiple people to make the decision, is this acceptable? And if that's acceptable, what we would do is add an exception or remove that test briefly while we let the build run through, and then we would just continue with the process. Does that make sense, Grant? Did I? Yes. Okay. Absolutely. So in that other release, so I just we just did that build here. I'm just going to show you this package here. Um, here's my data change. Okay, that's in that update script. And if I were to look at the integration, because it's already been deployed to integration, um, where's integration? Um, that data change exists here, right? That just passed through just as part of my change, okay? So uh, this is, I think, Nick, this was your question, manipulating C data. So this is what I'm doing. This is C data. This is, you know, it, it could be countries, it could be state zip codes, could be statuses, could be whatever. Um, I'm just manipulating data in this way. All right, uh, other questions? Uh, did we get to the um, how do you manage changes that are not part of the data definition, like manipulating seed data? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's what I kind of just did here. I mean, I can, you Yeah, know, that's what I thought so. Yeah, if I shoot this out, it's, it's still in this environment, it's still different, but if I deploy this, uh, in, a, in a minute we'll see that data change go through, and it should be fairly quickly, so... Uh, let me run this feature. Right, then that was our last question. Oh, okay. Good. You guys are cool. pretty easy audience, not uh, too concerned. Ron, hopefully I answered your question. Uh, the rest of you guys, uh, hopefully it made sense. And in a second, we'll see this come through, and I'll call it quits. <laughs> come on, Octopus. <laughs> so, I mean, it looks funny for, you know, there's a change go through, right? It looks funny to see me doing this really quickly because typically, you know, it's it's, hours for us to make a change, right? I mean, the developer right. has to change, we have to throw it through, we want somebody manually to go test it perhaps in the application, right? I'm doing this stuff really quickly, so these delays seem long, but typically, you know, somebody would say, a QA guy would say, or a QA girl would say, hey, I need this in test environments. And then the client would say, hey, can you throw this in production? And so I would, I would click here and say, hey, let me test it real quick. This will take me half an hour, and then I'll deploy it to production. Um, right. And Alberto says this is very new for him. Um, he'll have to try it out. And Alberto, that's the one thing I would say is that uh, do try it out yourself. Um, start off with just the CI process, continuous integration. Um, that's relatively easy to set up, especially if you set up on a blank database. You get that working and then you can start to expand. Yeah. So it, here's what I usually recommend, and, and Grant, tell me if you like this. I usually tell people, uh, download Git because there's so much information about their Git. It's simple, it's lightweight, it's smooth, it's easy to install. Okay? Right. Download Git, create a new database on your desktop with uh, one table in it, one column, one table. Right? So where's my thing? So what I typically do is when I want to do a new system, a new proof of concept, um, create data, database POC, not POS, POC, okay? And then use PSC, and then uh, my table, my ID hint. This is what I create. Now, my job is to get this database from here to another SQL Server instance. And so what I do is I will uh, link this to source control. So here I would say, God, I've got to link this. So where's Git? Where's my folder? I don't know what I did, but usually that doesn't happen. <laughs> I think I blew up. I've been playing with my demo thing. Uh, but what I would do is I would link it to my Git repository, and I would you know, maybe add one more column to the table and and just make sure it appears in my repository. So when I go to my repository, which here is, um, uh, I don't even know where it is now. Wherever I showed you earlier, this thing. 
Yes, I know. I would just want to make sure that that table existed in here. And then like Grant said, I would set up CI and uh, I do not love Jenkins. Jenkins is free and you can use Jenkins. But what I would say is either use Team City, which here's my Team City system and I have one of these other ones set up. And if and this is pretty simple too, is this one makes it really easy is that I, you know, I do a build and I just use plugins to do it, or I would go to, um, and this is where I do a lot of stuff, is I would go to visualstudio.com and I would set up a build here. And there is a Redgate plugin here to do the build as well. So either, either TeamCity or visualstudio.com, I would just do it. And then see if I could just deploy this to another instance. And I would just do a proof of concept to let me get started. And once I'm happy with that, then I can talk about everything else. Yeah, I agree. I agree. I mean, because you just, you want to get the concepts of the of the process going, not try to plug in your whole yeah. Don't you know, try to put entire it in. dev and everybody. You know, yeah, you make yourself insane that way. Yeah. But, um, yeah, I agree. Yeah, That's a good idea. Just one database, one table, one column. Just move that. If you can move that, add a column, move that. And if you're happy, then you can start to go. All right, let me pick small application or a test application, get other people involved and see how it works. Um, it's getting late, so I want to close this down. Right. If you guys want to get a hold of us, ladies and gentlemen, DLM at Redgate.com is a great way to get a hold of us. Uh, slash DLM at Redgate also gives you information. We do have some training from partners. Redgate right now is not doing training, but uh, it's slash training. We have a few different partners in the U.S. and in Europe that will do training for you and help you out. Uh, or if you need consulting help. But really, I'd say, you know, download it. If you've got the tool belt, uh, just try. Just play with it and see what happens. And, uh, and you'll, you'll be amazed, I think.